Welcome to the Bio Balance HealthCast, episode number 367, Treating the Help Rejecting Complainer. BioBalance HealthCast features conversations about positive aging. Your hosts are Dr. Kathy Maupin, Medical Director of BioBalance Health and a leading expert in treating symptoms of aging, and Brett Newcomb, a licensed professional counselor. Dr. Maupin and Brett are the authors of The Secret Female Hormone, the seminal work about hormone replacement therapy for women, which is available on Amazon or from Dr. Maupin's office at BioBalance Health. Dr. Maupin's office is currently accepting new patients. So today is going to be a session with Brett. (laughs) I, um, I had an encounter with a patient last week, which made me then look into all of the patients that say that we can't help them, or that's like 5% of our patients that come in leave saying, uh, it didn't work. So that 5% I went through and I realized that many of them seem to have the same shtick. So I describe, so I'm going to describe to you and to Brett again, the shtick that these patients would have. And, and You'll recognize it. Just assume that you're, you are in any part of your life, you have encountered people like this. So they'll come in and they'll be so excited to see me and they want to get better. And so I explain their lab. I explain what's wrong and how we're going to fix it. At first they say, oh yeah, I'll, you know, I have to do in any treatment plan, I have to do part of it they have to do the rest because there are certain things you have to do. You have to take medicine or you have to change your diet or you have to take a supplement, but there are other things that are necessary for the patient to do to actually get better. So when we meet again is when the whole issue starts. It didn't work for me. And then they're not happy. It come, happens really fast. It's between the first and second visit. It didn't work for me. I'm just, I just don't know if I should do this again. Now, granted, there are some things, I'm giving myself an out, that do cause it not to work and we fix it. But these are the people that it, on paper it worked, their lab looks beautiful, you know, they should feel great, and that nah, didn't work. So I go through, well, have you done this? No, have you done this? No, I couldn't do that, I was allergic to that. I, I can't take this, I can't take that. That didn't work, I can't believe you give that to other people. I mean, that kind of, that's the conversation with me. And then I say, well, and I have learned to say, I've done my, my part of this and you have to do your part of this. So if you're unwilling to do your part of this, then this isn't going to work for you. And then you need to find another doctor because I can't take it when they do that. They really, in their mind, don't want to do, they don't want to get better or they don't want to do what I say, or they hate authority, but there's some reason they, they suck the life out of me because I am always trying to make them better. And I used to give them lots of chances. And now I don't do that anymore. I just say, this is how we're doing it. Oh, the other thing they do is they change doses on me. Like they'll take double of this or half of this and, and they don't tell me, and they don't know what the side effects are like thyroid. And then all of a sudden they've got heart palpitations and it's my fault. So they're blamers. They blame me for, blame somebody for everything. They're fat because their mother fed them the wrong way. Or they're blamers, but they're also, they don't want to change. They like where they are and they like to be uh, accusatory. But But they don't know that. They don't know that. I mean, that's that's not a deliberate calculation on their part to behave that way. But they've learned that they have, I guess they've they learned something to get yeah. something out of right. it. And, they and what they're off. getting from me is all my energy for that day. And then I'm like, I can't go on to the next patient. I've just had all my energy taken out of me by that one patient. And now I'm going to be a cripple the rest of the day until I recharge. Well, yeah, that's what you have to learn. And then you have to make different choices. So what, so Brett, what is that? And well, why, how do we deal with it? What you're experiencing is when I have patients come in and, and this is what we're discussing, I talk to them about emotional economics. And when I say that, what I mean is every choice that you make costs you something. You have to expend some energy and, and, and it, it returns something. So the question becomes, 
are the choices that you're making worth the price you're paying? You're making good choices, you're making mm -hmm. healthy choices. And this is what I would say about the dynamic between you and these patients when you get frustrated. Uh, there is a distinction that I think we ought to make at the beginning of this conversation between your kind of practice and my kind of practice. I am a mental health counselor. My training and my expertise, my job is to sit with them and talk to them, listen to them, and reflect back to them what, how I'm understanding them so that they have an opportunity to recognize and make different choices. They may or may not make those. You have a different situation because you are a medical doctor with medical procedures and lab results that you can obtain, discuss, manipulate, change, mm -hmm. and you can do something, you can inject this or give this mm -hmm. medicine, that you know what the changes will occur as a result of your mm -hmm. treatment yes. if they follow your treatment. Mm -hmm. So part of what you're describing is what we call the non-compliant client, okay. patient, who doesn't do what they're supposed to do. And they will come in, and in that conversation, they will uh, impute to you the responsibility for it not working, for their right. not being able to do it. Right. I didn't feel like two Advil were doing me any good, so I took four. You know, and, and you told them, don't take any Advil at all. Mm -hmm. you know? Well, but I'm used to Advil. Advil's always worked for me before. Well, <laughs> don't take any Advil because we've replaced what about... And, and they look at you and go, oh, okay. And then they go right home and take two more Advil because they have a headache or they don't feel well. <laughs> then true. when they come back, they say, you don't know what you're doing. You didn't help me. All these other people say, you help them. You're not helping me. Mm -hmm. Why not? Mm -hmm. And so what's happening here, we call this kind of patient the help-rejecting mm -hmm. complainer. The help rejecting complainer is the most frustrating and most seductive patient that a therapist can encounter mm -hmm. because they come into the office and they say, oh, I've heard such good things about you. I know that you're going to be able to help me. I'm suicidal. You know, you're going to keep me alive week to week, whatever. And they mean it. The energy that they mm -hmm. pour out for mm -hmm. you is very attractive, seductive, mm -hmm. not in a sexual sense, but in an emotional mm -hmm. sense of pulling you in. Mm -hmm. it's, it's an entrapment strategy. And what they want from the therapist is the therapist's energy. What they want from you is your energy. And they get a payoff. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's the, we're talking about the emotional economics. Mm -hmm. They get the payoff when you become more concerned about their health and survival than they appear mm -hmm. to be. Mm -hmm. You start trying to, to find a solution, mm -hmm. an adjustment. Well, what if we did this way? Mm -hmm. What if instead of taking a pill in the morning, you took a half a pill in the morning and a half a pill in the mm -hmm. afternoon? Or what if you took one every second day? Uh, you know, let's, mm -hmm. let's find a way that makes this work that's for you. That's true. And that's what we do. And, and you really get, <laughs> involved mm -hmm. and emotionally invested in trying to get them better. Mm -hmm. They sit back and take that emotion out of you, put it in themselves. Mm -hmm. When they come in, they're low, they're low in affect, mm -hmm. low in energy, mm -hmm. frustrated, downtrodden. Mm -hmm. When they leave, they're feeling all better. You're feeling worse mm -hmm. because they've taken your energy. It's mm -hmm. like the childhood game of hot potato. Yeah. Here, you hold mm -hmm. it. So <laughs> they hand it to you and you're holding it. And then they leave and you, the rest of the day you have this hot potato you're trying to do mm -hmm. something with. So then you have to use, you have to go take four Advil. <laughs> <laughs> so, but they leave and they feel better. And then they come back and it's the same dance again and my nurses say say the same thing right and they say oh my god i gotta see this patient she's never happy so so clinically when, when i used to train therapists we spent a lot of time mm -hmm. talking about when you're doing therapy and you get the help rejecting complainer how do you recognize it mm -hmm. and what do you do about it mm -hmm. so they have to learn as you have begun to learn not to invest the energy you still do the problem solving but you don't take the hot potato Mm -hmm. You step back and say, you know, have what we call good boundaries, healthy boundaries. Mm -hmm. This is not my problem. If you don't take the medicine the way I tell you, if you don't do the things like, like you've got to, as you say to me pretty often, because I'm sort of a help rejecting complainer, <laughs> you have to quit eating so much sugar. Yep. I mean, I, my body is desiring sugar. It responds genetically, as you taught me, differently to sugar than other people's mm -hmm. do. So I crave it. And I... I I think about it and I want it and I go get it and I sneak off and go get it, you know. Uh, and then, like, you have me and get, Phyllis watching. Absolutely, it. I get punished for that. Uh, so, I know that if I want to be healthy, I have to limit my sugar intake. Mm -hmm. But when I get emotionally distressed or exhausted or upset or what have you, you know, like an alcoholic who needs a drink. I'm looking for a candy bar. I'm looking for ice cream. I'm looking for something that's going to give me that little surge of sugar that makes me feel better. And they're looking for somebody to suck the life out of. Yes, that's but exactly. But they don't know they're doing that. They don't know that. Okay. That is not a conscious repertoire on their part. Mm -hmm. So so the trick for the clinician, and I think for your nurses and for the doctors, 
is to recognize the emotional exchange that's going on. Mm -hmm. So when you recognize that you're putting more energy into it Mm -hmm. and paying a larger Mm -hmm. price, then we go back to emotional economics for you. Mm -hmm. What are you getting out of the choices that you're making? Mm -hmm. Your desire has been all of your adult life to be a healer, Mm -hmm. to fix people, to help people, to make them better. You study hard, you work hard, you bring energy to the table, and you want the opportunity to put a, put a patient in front of me, and boy, I can, I can mm-hmm. perform miracles. And you do. And typically, that works, and they go home happy, and you go home happy, and it's all mm-hmm. good. But if you get the help-rejecting complainer, they're dancing to a different tune. They're not there to get what you can do for them medically. Mm-hmm. They're there to get your energy. Mm-hmm. And when they get you frustrated mm-hmm. or angry, are exhausted Mm -hmm. they've won so if you get worked up Mm -hmm. if you get if you get that surge feeling in Mm -hmm. yourself of of you're frustrated because they 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 don't like salads you know they can't eat a salad with vinegar and oil i have to have ranch dressing because you know i don't even limit that (laughs) well it it doesn't it doesn't the facts of the case don't matter because they're just background noise Mm -hmm. the reality is what we're doing here is an energy exchange Mm -hmm. i need to charge from you and leave mm-hmm. with your energy. And I can do that by frustrating you, by putting my expectations on you. That Making you're me feel gonna, guilty that I can't fix you. Well, first I make you feel good. I got to pump you up. Yeah. So I'm going to mm-hmm. tell you how brilliant you are. And I've heard all these things and I know all these people that my sister-in-law comes to you and you make her better and you know, all this stuff. And that's going to make you feel good. It's like, damn, I'm good. And, and I do this all the time. And yes, that's true. That is true. I recognize that. But every that. time somebody says that, it then, doesn't mean they're going to dump on you later. Then, well, no, it doesn't mean that. It, it's just this you, particular. You have to decide who's, who's doing the, this. And the way you know, the way you decide is what is the energy exchange? Mm-hmm. What do you feel? If you feel yourself firing off, if you mm-hmm. feel you're surging with anger or frustration, mm-hmm. you want to shake them. I, mean, <laughs> I don't know if you've ever seen somebody that you just wanted to slap. But yeah, there are some people You've been that, the object of that. <laughs> <laughs> you, you did not have to say that. Uh, there are I'm people, sorry. That is really That's okay. Unfair. That's right. You know, I have a perfectly balanced <laughs> emotional reaction to that. So these people are dancing an emotional dance. They, they have learned somewhere in their lives that their lives are more tolerable for them. If they can avoid all responsibility for outcomes, all responsibility for choice making, mm-hmm. and they're not really making choices. The, what, what happens is, like, for instance, in, in my profession, mm-hmm. uh, therapists aren't really supposed to solve problems. But many people who mm-hmm. go into learning to be a therapist mm-hmm. are pretty good problem solvers. Mm-hmm. And so they think, well, this is good. I can help make these people better because I can just explain to them, if you do this mm-hmm. and that, you won't be <laughs> yeah. depressed. Or if you do this and that, you, you won't have this anxiety. There are strategies that you can put out there, but they are reliant upon that patient going home and implementing the strategy. Right. If they're not going to do those right. things. Like, early warning sign. I used to have patients who would come in first visit and they would say at some point in the visit, do you give homework? You know, a lot of therapists give homework. You, you need to go home this week and you need to go to three AA meetings. You need to go home this week. You need to write four journal entries. You know? mm-hmm. and, and I would never answer the question, yes. I would say, do you need homework in order to be <laughs> successful? And they would yeah. sit and look at me and their mouths would fall open and be like, why would you say that? And I said, well, you raised the question. I said, I can give you homework if that's what you think you need. But in my experience, what will happen is you'll come in the next week and there'll be 32 reasons why you couldn't do the mm-hmm. homework this week, but you'll do it next week. Maybe if I could just modify it a little bit. So then the dance has begun. Uh-huh. So instead of giving them a writing assignment because their handwriting is so bad and they never have a piece of paper around. And you know, <laughs> I mean, yeah. the, the, the frustrating part of this, the way the dance works, is no matter what suggestion you come up with, Without any thought or investment of time, they immediately have five reasons why that right. won't work That's for right. them. It's close. That's right. I mean, I know that That's that works right. for a lot of people, mm-hmm. but, but it's, I, I don't have good penmanship. Okay, well, type it on a typewriter. Oh, I don't have a typewriter. Well, how about a computer? Oh, I don't have a computer. Well, the public library has computers. I, I don't have transportation. You know, it's, they, they just, yeah. so, so I'm sure that's a good thing, and I'm sure it would work for me. I, I just can't do it. Can you give me another reason why? And so if I fall prey to that mm-hmm. and I feed into offering You're them, racking your brain and using a lot of energy trying to figure out another answer. Things that I know work for other people, mm-hmm. things that other people are able to mm-hmm. do and are willing to do. Well, I've had some experience with people mm-hmm. who've done this. Uh, and what happens is there's a handoff of the football. They've handed mm-hmm. me the ball. I now have the problem. Mm-hmm. They no longer have the problem. They right. feel better. Mm-hmm. And they leave my office saying, I'm sure this was very helpful today. I always wondered 
Yeah. Why my parents, who both did this, <laughs> always went to the doctor and then came home and talked about how the advice was so stupid. Yeah. How they wouldn't possibly do this. It, what, that, what does that doctor know? He doesn't know anything. I don't know. But they would never take his or her advice, mm -hmm. which was so weird to me. I mean, I'm like, they must be very unusual didn't try people. It. They yeah. never even tried it. They wouldn't go to the next step. They would just like spend months talking about how stupid that doctor was because it made my father feel smarter than the doctor. But in well, he reality, already, he already felt that way. He already did. But yeah. in reality, it made him sicker. Yeah. Yeah, the net effect. And the, the, if you don't follow good advice when you're really sick, then you could end up sicker. And that's that's one of the lessons to be heard here. If you have, if you're married to a complaint, uh, help rejecting, help complaint. rejecting complainer, or if you uh, have a child like that, I mean, they literally can be taking their life in their hands by not following good advice. Well, in my case, that's you not have necessarily to learn true. How but to have good boundaries, you have to learn how to recognize and be able to say, "You are making choices right now. Are the choices that you make paying the dividend that you want to get?" Mm -hmm. Like I had a patient who had some chronic health issues, who was chronically non-compliant, and she would go to doctors, physicians, who would give her treatments and give her prescriptions and medicines and stuff, mm -hmm. that she would mess up all over the place. I mean, I often wondered if it was intentional mm -hmm. that she would, because, you know, she knows more. Right. right. Uh, even though she'd never been to medical school. Mm -hmm. But one day she came into my office and she was so frustrated uh, that she wasn't getting the payoff that she wanted in sympathy or problem solving from me. You know, like, you want mm -hmm. me to call your doctor and talk to you? Or, you know, uh, yeah. that she said, those doctors can perform miracles for other people. They just don't want to help me. Mm -hmm. And my thought was, maybe they don't. Maybe they want to fire you <laughs> <laughs> because you won't do what they tell you to yeah, do. Yeah, and that's very frustrating. It's just like when you explain everything, set your child up to do. This never happened to me, however. Yeah. Set your child up to do homework. And, you know, and you're going to sit there and read a book and answer questions. And you're putting out all the effort and the kid's like, playing with oh, something on the, the table. But but see, that's your responsibility. You're the one that's making those choices. And, I, and I'm, I, I'm not saying I did that. No, no. I hear patients tell me that I stuff. I understand that. And, and I work with a lot of families for whom that those were issues. And I had to work with the parents. You, you, you sort of stabilize the kid and park the kid and start working with the parents on boundaries, mm -hmm. consequences, rules. You know, if, if you ever hear yourself, I would tell parents this all the time. If you ever hear yourself saying, how many times have I told you? You've told them too many times. <laughs> you know, the, the modern middle-class educated family, the biggest issue that they tend to have is they believe in the power of epiphany. They want to explain till the cows come home. And mm -hmm. they think at some point their 10 year old is going to go, aha, I need to put away my <laughs> electronic stuff and get some sleep. Well, that is never going to happen. Uh -uh. So you simply have to have consequences uh -huh. and you message to the child, you're making some choices here. And if you make choice A, this is what it pays. If you make choice B, this is what it pays. And then when they make a choice, A or B, give them the, the reward. You know, I used to tell my son, you bought the ticket, take the ride. You, uh -huh. know, you made the choice. Uh -huh. And I respect your choice. So you chose to lose your electronics for three days. What? Very clearly with warning ahead. I mean, you, you never do reactive punishments. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm mad, so I'm reacting. Mm -hmm. You do planned consequences mm -hmm. you, and you message it in advance to your kids. This is what will happen if you make choice A. This is what will happen if you make choice B. But when my kids started driving, we had a curfew mm -hmm. and he would want to come in after curfew and then explain to me why he was late. And he always had 27 good reasons, except I would never listen to him. I would say, I, I'm not interested in that. You're a grown up. You've made the choice. The cost of your choice is you don't drive next weekend. Mm -hmm. So I don't care if you rescued three nuns from a burning fire. I mean, I do care. I'm happy for you. I'm glad you were willing to, to make that choice as a good citizen. Mm -hmm. But we don't need to have this discussion because the consequence of that choice, you've already chosen. And that's the same thing that you do with patients. Anybody has to do yes. with patients is say, well, you've made the choice not to follow that diet. Therefore... You have the consequences. You have the consequences. You're not going to lose weight because right. it takes... Or not to exercise. Or not, not to, to walk, exercise. Yeah. Or not to do anything to help yourself. Now, having said that, before they get treatment, sometimes they're just too tired to do any of those things. Right. So I can't tell ahead of time and who's going to be like different. this yes. until I've seen the second or third time I see them. Right. Because that 
that to me is out. I have to just go along with it and say, well, they'll probably be optimistic because that saves me energy. Well, and that's been your experience. Mm -hmm. But when they come in and say, let's play hot potato, mm -hmm. then you have to learn how to say, no, thank yeah, you. I don't play right. hot potato. That's right. And and my nurses as well. Yes. One of the other things that we uh, that I wanted to ask you as a counselor is... Um, when patient, when patients, or but this could be any anybody that anyone deals with, is um, you are trying to help them, and then they call every day for a change in plan. Okay, every day, right? Or email every day, right? I I, I can't do that. So what do you want me to do? What, what can I do next? Or I tripled this. Now what do I do? Mm. I'm like. You tripled it. You, you, hormones, by the way, hormones take a long time to work. You can't change. It's not the ICU. You can't change the treatment every day. Mm -hmm. So this is one of those things where I I get frustrated and I and yeah I get I feel like I lose energy because my nurses are very upset that somebody is changing their own treatment, my nurse practitioners, and they're writing them every day and they, you know, should I respond or should I wait or should, you know, how should I do this? So I'm just asking you. Well, you have to make a distinction in your own mind between a legitimate crisis and a distress call. Mm -hmm. And when it's a legitimate crisis, a medical thing that needs to happen, mm -hmm. then you need to respond. Otherwise, you need to have better, better messaging. You need to say, for instance, I, I would have clients that in, in the beginning, when I first started practice and I didn't know what I learned over 30 years, mm -hmm. uh, I would get suicidal calls in the middle of the night, clients that had decided that they were going to kill themselves and that they needed to talk to me so mm -hmm. that I could talk them off the ledge. Uh, I, w I found that I was sending signals to them non-verbally that says, you're going to need me. I'm worried about you. Oh. I want you to know that I'm here for you. When you need me, I'm available. And so, boy, they'd need me in the middle of the night. I learned over time to say, I'm here, but you need you. And mm -hmm. I'm confident that you have the strength and I know that you're going to be okay. And these are the things when you feel this way that you're going to do. Mm -hmm. And you teach them to do that. So the last several years that I was in practice, I didn't get suicidal calls. People just weren't calling because they didn't get the messaging that that was necessary or okay. Okay. Uh, so part of it is the messaging that you send out mm -hmm. to have good boundaries. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and you and your nurses have to learn to make that distinction. Mm -hmm. Is this a true medical emergency? Mm -hmm. I mean, we, we put on our recording. Mm -hmm. if, you, if you have a therapist, you ever call their office, you'll get, if this is a true medical emergency, go immediately to the emergency room. Mm -hmm. You know, take yourself there. Be responsible mm -hmm. for this. Uh don't say, well, I left a call here and you didn't call back, so it's okay for me to kill myself. Right. Yeah. Give somebody else the blame. The blame. Yeah. Yeah. So, so that that makes sense. That makes sense, and that and that should make sense to all of you who have had a child call you five times a day, or a, <laughs> you have to have the boundaries. You have, to have boundaries. You that, say, okay, that, we've had this conversation. If you call me again, then the consequence is going to be X. Mm -hmm. You know. Okay. Because you're out at a party, your kids call it. Mm -hmm. you know, five, ten times trying to interrupt mm -hmm. the party because mm -hmm. they're ticked off that you're not giving them whatever they want. Mm -hmm. And you say, I'm not home. We've already had this discussion. You already know my position. You make your choice. Mm -hmm. But live with the consequences because when I get home, this is going to be what happens. Okay. Well, I think that's Don't really good temper. advice. Don't rant and rant. Really good counseling. <laughs> and everybody here got it free. <laughs> Which is what it's worth. Which, no, it isn't. Yeah. It's very good. It's very good counseling. And I, and I think that if you really think about it, you'll be able to name these people in your life. You'll and feel them. You'll, you'll feel them. You'll feel it. it. Yeah. Yeah. You just have to become aware of that. And that when you feel like you're so exhausted after talking to somebody, then maybe you need better boundaries with them. You check your level of investment. Check the if it's hot potato. If we're mm -hmm. trading off uh, the energy back and forth. Thank you for listening to us today. Email your questions or comments to podcast at biobalancehealth.com. You can find the Biobalance Healthcast on iTunes and on YouTube. For more information about bioidentical hormone pellet therapy and other reverse aging solutions, visit biobalancehealth.com or call 314-993-0963. You can find Dr. Maupin on Twitter at Dr. Kathy Maupin and on Facebook at facebook.com slash biobalancehealth. Find Brett Newcomb at brettnewcomb.com.